OK, great. Um, hi, everyone, and, and welcome to our October Reproducibility. We're delighted to see so many of you join today. And we're particularly delighted to welcome Will Cawthorn who, as our speaker today. So Will is going to talk about establishing an open research culture um, in his own lab. So he's based at the University of Edinburgh Centre for Cardiovascular Science and um, where he leads a group. And he's going to chat about how he's established an open research culture in his in his research group. And then as his position as the University of Edinburgh's Open Science Ambassador for the League of European Research Universities, Will is also going to cover some of the activity that's been happening at the University of Edinburgh um, to kind of embrace and advance open research practices through the open research roadmap. So I'll kind of leave the rest to, to Will, but the format of the of today's kind of session will be the same as as usual. So we'll have a talk for for about half an hour and um, or a little bit longer, and then we'll open it up for discussion. And again, we encourage kind of people to to share their thoughts, and we want this to be as interactive as possible. So I'll hand it over to to Will, and you can start with the with the talk. Great. Okay. So thanks for the opportunity to talk today. And uh, again, I'll, I'll apologize for having to cancel very late two weeks ago. It was a busy week before half term holidays for the schools here. Um, so yeah, there's uh, I've adapted this slide just in, in the interest of transparency from a nice image that was from the um, Academy for Medical Sciences, which just highlights various aspects of open research, uh, shifting research culture and some of the challenges and some of the ways um, forward. Uh, and something that I think I, I uh, empathise and recognise a lot is this thing where um, we all want to help and want to do more, but time is just very, very tight and it's frustrating when you feel like you just can't do as much as you want to. And I think that's, that's one of the barriers to um, to implementing more open practices and improving research culture on a bigger level. So just to give an outline of what I'll talk about today, firstly, why exactly am I here? I'm not an expert in um, metrics or research assessment or practices for open research. I'm just a researcher, but in the process of doing a PhD and a postdoc and, and then setting up my own lab, you can become increasingly frustrated with uh, various aspects of science, how it's practiced. So how we're assessed, the over-reliance on metrics, which maybe aren't that useful or informative at all, how science is communicated. So why do we pay to publish the research that we've invested so much effort into? And then journals then get a subscription so that, you know, it's not openly available. And then some of the consequences for how science is then managed. So how some of these incentives can maybe for scientists to um, to make bad decisions. So those are some of the consequences of these uh, these effects. So then in terms, and I was a bit worried, I, I have to say I've been nervous since agreeing to this talk um, because I think people want some concrete steps and advice. If you're a PI, how can you implement open research practices or work to improve research culture? And in planning for this, I was kind of reflecting on what I've actually done. Um, there's lots of things I haven't done. There's lots of things I do that I don't do very well that I'd like to do better. And this gets back to that just being overwhelmed. There just isn't enough time. I think science as a whole is under resourced. So we're given lots of tasks to do, but maybe not the, the staff power or the financial resources to really do them well. And it's a major frustration. But there are some things I've done, I hope, um, and a lot of those are a reflection of my intrinsic motivation, which I'll talk about in part A. Um, but then I've realised a lot of those are down to just extrinsic factors. So shifts in research culture, some policies that have been implemented that can promote open research. And then a lot of it's just luck, to be honest. Um, I'm fortunate to have been in a situation where I've been able to take some steps that other people might not have felt able to take because of pressures, etc. Uh, and then getting on to the final part about so these extrinsic factors, um, which I think are probably the most important. You need to have motivation as an individual, and I think we all should because it improves science. But that motivation won't get far if you're just swimming against the current. So we need to shift that current and improve culture as a whole. And that's where I'll talk a bit about the, um, the work with Lero and the open research roadmap that the university is um, pushing for. 
Okay, so often if you go and give a talk um, at a conference, you have to have a conflict of interest slide at the first start of the talk. And so I can't see my pointer here. Can you see your pointer? Uh, there we are. Um, and so you think, oh, have, do I work for a company? I've been paid by a pharma company or do I hold stock and whatever? Um, and you have to tick a box and say what your conflicts and interests are. And if you don't have these, then you say, oh, I've got no conflicts of interests. I'm great and I'm doing things for magnanimous reasons and none of my research is conflicted. So it must be brilliant. But then if you think about how science is practiced, um, there's this idea that to really advance your career, to get grants, to get promotions, you've got to publish your research in prominent journals. You need to bolster your, your metrics, your H index. This person's got an H index of 175, so they must be really happy with their life. Um, you need to get money to do the, you know, get big grants in and hopefully then build a big lab. And it just goes in this vicious cycle. So then, you know, now it snowballs, you know, you've got a big lab so you can do more research, you can publish more, you can build your, your uh, metrics, you can get more money and blah, 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 it goes on and on. So these cause intrinsic conflicts of interest just in terms of how science is practiced because there's sort of a cultural bias towards positive data and shiny new impactful discoveries, um, negative data, negative sounds bad, uh, it's a stupid, uh, way of referring to data. Uh, I'll get back to that later. Um, you've got to publish high impactful research. So what does that even mean? Uh, impact sounds good, but what is impact? It's usually telling quite a clear story, even though science is rarely so clear. It's usually messy, um, often post hoc, you know, hawking, post hoc storytelling. Uh, there's often a, a practice of you sort of you downplay things that go against that story, even if you're trying to be open and uh, you know progressive with everything. It's very easy to find reasons why, oh, this data we don't trust it for this reason, but this data that supports my idea that must be must be true. And so then there's this bias towards the interests and the impact of research instead of its reliability. And then finally, there's a trend in science. You know, you get in each discipline you get bandwagons and hot topics and so people tend to jump on those and um, in my postdoc we often tried to think of like the most contrived paper title that would tick all the boxes for all, all the hot topics things about the microbiome and I don't know using single cell RNA sequencing and all this stuff so do you really have no conflicts of interest? You don't need all this funding, you know, these explicit conflicts of interest, this kind of intrinsic things built into how we practice research that can maybe compromise the outcomes. Um, and so these are all things that I've sort of thought about um, during my my passage along my uh, PhD. I'll just turn my phone off. <laughs> um, yeah, which have, have led to this sort of exasperation that I find with um, how research is assessed, the culture, the cult of research assessment, um, a lot of the consequences of the mismeasurement of science and some of these practices. And then thinking about science communication, as I said at the beginning, OK, so we we get taxpayer or charity funding to do our research. We work really hard to try and find some conclusions. We work really hard to write it up. And then we go to a journal who we pay to publish it, and then they get other people to pay to access it. Just it's bonkers, like it's totally crazy. Um, but thankfully, that's changing. Okay, so going more into the, this exasperation with research assessment, I gave a talk on this about two years ago, and some of this is taken from that. I realise it's not the key topic of today, but it kind of gets at why we should all be intrinsically motivated to change things. So if you think about when we're assessed as scientists and when our research is assessed, there's various steps. So, you know, most of us probably have applied for a PhD, we've def maybe defended a PhD, maybe published, uh, then you go on to job applications, funding, tenure, maybe you've got tenure and you apply for promotion. So I remember in my PhD, I published one main paper and a few, like one or two, like a review and some smaller co-authorships. Um, and when it came to this question, where should we publish it? 
uh, my PI was like, oh, we've got to think of the impact factor of the journal. And this, I'm not being disparaging from my PI, she was brilliant um, and very supportive, but that very much was, and to many extents still is the culture, we've got to think about the impact of the journal. So I was like, well, what, is, what does this mean? What is the impact factor? I'm not going to go into it too much here. Um, there's loads of literature about how illogical it is, how statistically unsound it is. Um, the problems of using a journal level metric to assess individual papers and individual researchers. There's a lot on that. But I did in advance of the talk, I gave a few years on this. I had a Twitter poll just because I was curious about other people's perception of the impact factor. Um, and actually this becoming aware of it during uh, your PhD is, is quite common. Some undergrads now are aware of it. Thankfully, we're not um, uh, you know, trying to convert school children to, to this cult of impact factors, they're blissfully unaware of it. There's probably not many school kids on Twitter as well who are following me, which is good. Um, yeah, but it, it is quite pervasive from an early stage of an academic career, becoming aware of these kinds of things. And then you go further on your career stage and, you know, there's a real focus on these high impact journals. What does that mean? If, if your paper is in a high impact journal, does that inherently mean it's really good? Conversely, if it's in a lower journal, does that mean it's worthless or less worthy? No, I don't think so. Um, and then other, other ways of assessing this, you know, it's not just impact factor. We've got your H index, how many citations you have overall, how many times has your paper been cited, all of these kinds of things. So is there any evidence that these are actually good ways to assess a researcher uh, in terms of their creativity, their potential contributions, their ability to support students and other researchers? Um, so yeah, there's, there was a good talk on this yesterday, two days ago for part of the London Open Science Week. There's many, many metrics out there, and this is not my specialty, but it is certainly a point of interest for me. Um, we like metrics because they give us the this sort of reassuring number, it must be objective, but actually there's a lot of smoke and mirrors around. Okay, so Stephen Curry at Imperial has written a lot about impact factors and I recommend people read uh, on his previous um, writing about this. Uh, he's, I think he's now the, the head for DORA and implementing that. Um, but basically pointing out that impact factors just from a statistical basis are, are not really defensible, defensible, um, and yet they persist. And so again, another poll I did around the, the time two years ago, most researchers think that journal level metrics, i.e. the impact factor, are still given the most importance when others assess their quality as a researcher. And there's lots of ways you could do, point out how absurd this is with analogies. So why does this persist? We know that they're not really valid, but it's just this sort of dogmatic persistence. And I think you can make a good analogy with the story of the emperor's new clothes. And we see that other researchers talk about them as though they're important. And so you might think they don't seem like they should be important, but everyone seems to think they're great. OK, so they must be great. And so just this fallacy just perpetuates. But I think it's important uh, if you hear people, you know, we've signed DORA now as the University of Edinburgh, we should not be talking about these things. Maybe they have some value for journals and for journal editors, but as a researcher, let's just stop talking about them. It's nonsense. So if you do hear people talk about impact factors, just point out that they're, they, they shouldn't be. <laughs> okay, so that's at sort of these stages. And then um, since being a PI and in a postdoc reviewing papers, but more so now, um, or grants, you often get asked to comment on the importance or the impact, uh, particularly from certain journals. And so you have to wonder if we can actually predict that. Um, so, where am I? Hold on. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you think about high impact journals, good journals, um, you often get asked to answer questions like this. Who's going to be interested in reading it? How significant are the claims? What does that even mean? This is funny. Is the paper likely to be one of the five most significant papers published in the discipline this year? How the hell can you tell that? How can you predict that? And how does it stand out from others in its field? Okay, you could probably have some subjective comments on that. 
Um, and just this comment again from Stephen Curry that, you know, you can try and carefully sift and select for the, the important, impactful, significant papers, but no one can really do that. There's always going to be things that fall through the gaps and um, conversely things that do make it into these journals that turn out not to have much um, importance in the long term. Uh, there's been some interesting studies on this, and again, I realise this is sort of tangential about the whole the topic of this talk, but it gets at why we should be motivated to improve research assessment, or at least question how it's done a bit more. This was a, an editorial in Science magazine from maybe 10 years ago. What they did was looked at grants funded by the NIH in the USA, and some of them are ranked in the highest tier, some are middle, some are lower, but these were all able to be funded. So these are the scores, percentile scores that were given. What they then did was said, okay, we funded all this research. Are the ones that were ranked better at the time of application, did they have better outcomes? And the answer is no. So if you look at the number of publications from each grant, the top funded ones didn't publish more. They didn't get more cited. If anything, they got less cited because they usually got funded more and the, the total number of citations for the most notable papers from each of these was not um, was no different. So it suggests that, OK, we can try and assess and predict the importance of proposed research, but actually we're objectively not able to do that. Um, and this gets a, a general thing in human psychology. If, if we have expertise in something, or at least we perceive to be experts in something, we overvalue our ability to make predictions about outcomes. But usually you can't predict where new knowledge will lead us. And this is especially the case in really complex uh, situations, such as with science research. Um, I recommend anyone, if you have the time to read this book, it's excellent. Um, uh, Daniel Kahneman looking at uh, overconfidence and expertise. So what you find is a great deal of confidence in the presence of very poor accuracy the confidence people have is not a good indication of how accurate they are. And I think you see this in grant review, in peer review, and in many other areas. And that's perhaps why we have come to over-rely on metrics, because they give this feeling of being uh, getting reliable information and assessing things in this objective way. But then I think it's a false sense of security. Um, the metrics are often not fit for that purpose. So that's why I hate the sort of dogmatic, illogical approaches to research assessment. And then what are the consequences of this mismeasurement? And so why should we, we be incentivized to, to change things? So I think by mismeasuring science in this way and by um, having these flawed incentives, uh, it really promotes poor research practice and management of researchers. Um, if as a PhD student or a postdoc or a PI, you think I need to publish positive data in these high impact journals that tells a clear story where you can see what the, the knock on effects might be. And this is not to say that anybody who, um, the, 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 the incentives uh, in research practice, it's not to say that the individuals are bad individuals and they're trying to be you know, nefarious and commit fraud. It's just these gentle nudge effects can skew people subconsciously one way or the other. Or sometimes you might get outright fraud from people who are just selfish and short-sighted. But um, Yeah, so this was a good uh, analogy for, for impact factors and apologies for all the text. Peter Lawrence has written some really excellent things um, starting in the 90s about research culture and assessment. So I recommend you read some of his things. Um, but just to read this out, he says, it's fun to imagine songwriters being assessed in the way that scientists are today. And this is from about 20 years ago, but it still stands. Bureaucrats would count the number of songs produced and rank them by which radio stations they were played on during the first two weeks after release, because impact factors are based on the first two years after publication. Um, the songwriters would soon find that producing junky Christmas tunes and cozying up to DJs from top stations would advance their careers more than composing proper music. And so you have this, if you, if you can publish shiny sort of hot topic research that tells a really clear compelling story and maybe if you have a good relationship with editors from top journals then you can advance your career but that's not necessarily how science it's it's a it's a focus on impact and interest rather than reliability 
So then he says, it's not so funny that in the real world of science, dodgy evaluation criteria such as impact factors and citations are dominating minds, distorting behavior and determining careers. So if we think about some of these consequences, um, so you've got this bias towards high impact journals. We're all pushed for time. We can't read everything. I struggle to read the limited number of relevant papers uh, that, that are in my field. Um, but by focusing on this, you, you know, you might be ignoring relevant research elsewhere. And it gives this unrealistic expectation of how science progresses. You don't usually have these really clear, clean stories the most evidence might point that way, but other evidence might go against that. And we should be including any evidence that is reliable and not just the ones that support this nice story. If we're always chasing these high impact publications, then it's almost guaranteed to delay the publication and the dissemination of knowledge. There's, there's data on this. I've got loads of other slides I could show uh, that show how um, as you go through rounds of rejection, you're always nudging down this impact factor hierarchy and it's just slowing things down and it's just silly. Um, it's this cult of a journal. And I think that then imposes a barrier towards, or it has done, I think this is changing in a major way, but it's imposed a barrier against more innovative publishing methods such as open access, that's definitely changing. But things like registered reports, there's still this, um, reluctance of scientists to embrace creativity and new approaches, which is ironic because that's what science should be about. Um, and then potentially it's incentivizing uh, fraudulent or at least sloppy research, um, perhaps misconduct in some cases, but otherwise maybe just subconscious bias against uh, just easily accepting the results that you like and maybe questioning or discarding the ones you don't because you can come up with a reason for why they're not valid. And then it also, I think, can discourage the, the pursuit of more risky ideas. Maybe it's easier to propose safer ideas uh, in grant proposals than really pushing the boundaries. Again, I think that's changing in some ways. And this is a major one. I'll talk about this in the next two or three slides. Um, in terms of our motivation and our welfare as scientists, um, at least for me, I can see how should we be assessed? What is a logical way to try and assess a researcher and our research versus how do I feel we're assessed, which just seems so illogical and unfair in many ways and kind of down to random chance. That's a frustrating thing to work against because you feel like you're, you're pushing against a barrier that is just uh, immobile and it won't go anywhere. You can get this sense that our research is just a box ticking exercise. The end justifies the means. So the goal should be to publish reliable knowledge and to advance knowledge. But for career progression, etc., it often seems like, well, the goal is to publish high impact research. And that's not necessarily the same thing as reliable, robust research. And so you've got these extrinsic pressures coming up against. I think we're all intrinsically motivated to do good research. And it's really frustrating, you know, we don't, we could all go and get a job somewhere else that we don't really like and get paid much more money and probably more free time. But we do this because we care about it and it's interesting and you want to do well. And when you feel like there's a system out there which sort of prevents you from doing things properly or at least takes away your time to do things properly, it's really frustrating. Um, so in terms of the, this last issue and, and researcher welfare and motivation, as a PI, something I was aware of and I think something maybe you'll see as you progress through science you you can see how your own PI supervisor or mentors approach things and you can take the good and the bad from that so for my postdoc I was at the University of Michigan it's got a massive football stadium it's probably not very COVID safe there that's me when I'm younger looking happy at a football game um, and my PI here was a guy called Ormond McDougald who's Canadian but Scottish so it's funny I've been in Scotland so there he is when he's younger and he's killed he can play the bagpipes and everything. And uh, here he is when, when I was in the lab and there I am. And as you can see, we're all very happy and we generally were. He's a really, really good uh, scientist and just cares about, um, not about proving his idea, but just saying, well, we're just trying to find out what's true and we'll just see where that takes us. And so really he gave all the people in the lab a lot of freedom to pursue ideas and was pretty flexible. And it was certainly a fun place to work. And I think that was then 
something that I wanted to take into my own lab and say, well, I want to give people freedom to pursue things. I don't want to be, certainly don't want to be prescriptive. Um, the unfortunate um, converse of that was my wife's experience when we moved to Michigan, because she's also a researcher. And the first lab she was in, um, her PI was terrible. And I'm very happy to say that. I won't mention his name, but people probably could find it. I think there's not enough accountability for PIs in research. We have a lot of power, basically, over the PhD students and the postdocs who work in our labs. But there doesn't seem to be much accountability for managing those students and postdocs properly. And that's stupid because there's, that's a key part of uh, a researcher's career is that early stage of their career, not just in terms of their ability to do good research, but to be trained properly to think about the culture of science and how we do things. So, um, yeah, that was a really stark contrast for me where I found myself in a lab where everyone was very happy and it was run really, really well. Whereas my wife was in a lab where, um, I, I mean, the PI was essentially telling people to go and get this data. Um, it's completely unacceptable and that can just be crushing as a researcher where you just feel like you're a cog in a machine you're not there to think and be creative and maybe test new ideas and new avenues so that's something that i've always taken with me um and thinking i definitely don't ever want to run a lab like that and tell people that they have to do this and that um yeah uh, so that's sort of some of the consequences you can see of, of this mismeasurement and the, the poor research culture that I've been aware of. And then finally, just more quickly, and this is where there's maybe sunnier horizons, it's just the, what has been the status quo in science communication, which I mentioned earlier. And thankfully, that's now changing with a real embrace of preprints and open access. OK, so now that's a really long preamble, and I'll, this will be a much shorter bit. I was aware when I was asked to do the talk about uh, how I've established an open research culture in my lab and I thought, what have I actually done? I've got this motivation and this experience and I feel really strongly about it. Um, it's sort of like, for those of you who are PhD students or postdocs, a good way of, of doing a PhD would be right at the beginning to write a really in-depth review of your field so you know everything. And many of you maybe have had the chance to do that. But often what happens is you start, you start doing a bit of reading, but then you get busy with experiments and then those can take over. And then sometimes it's not until a year or two later, maybe even when you're writing your thesis, that you start finding things. You think, oh, I really wish I knew this three years ago, um, but I've just, just been too busy I think, at the time. And that's exactly what I think it's been like as a PI, where you can start and you think, right, I'm going to lay this solid foundation for the lab. I'm going to write a manual about the ethos of the lab and the approach and all this stuff. What's going to be my plan for data management, data sharing, open data, all this stuff. Um, and you maybe start off with that, but then things just snowball and you become so busy and overwhelmed that you then don't have the chance to really solidify all of that. You get, you know, we're just busy managing research, trying to get grants, writing papers, etc. Um, but there are still some things I've done. Um, so, and those have been motivated by this sort of intrinsic motivation, which I've been talking about, but also facilitated in my case, or in, impaired uh, by extrinsic factors, which is what we'll get on to. So in terms of actual steps, and I really apologize that this is quite a minor part of the talk for anyone looking for concrete advice. I mean, we've published preprints and uh, open access papers, of course. Uh, we've been able to deposit some of the code from our work and the source data, so for example, microarray data in GEO. Um, these are all things that are fairly easy to do. There's a really clear framework for doing this kind of thing. Something that I think is important is this idea of publishing results as long as they're conclusive. I hate the like, this term negative results is just such a load of crap. Um, you should think of results as being conclusive or inconclusive. Negative results can be powerfully conclusive and tell us really important things. Inconclusive results can still be useful because maybe they're inconclusive because they highlight the variability in a method or some flaws in a particular method. And publishing that knowledge is helpful for other researchers to say, oh, look, there's barriers with this method. You know, there's going to be some challenges if we try this. Um, but the terms positive and negative, they just have this inherent psychological bias. Negative is bad, positive is good, and it's just silly. So I think we should really be thinking of uh, results in a different way. And certainly two of the papers that I've published since becoming a PI are basically based on negative findings that have told us something interesting. If, you, if you've got a robust negative result, 
think about it. What's it telling you? It's probably telling you something useful. And then an important thing, and hopefully uh, Ben or anyone else who's been in my lab will agree, is I've tried to encourage lab members to follow their own ideas and their own interests. Um, and so uh, Carla, who was a postdoc in the lab, we published this paper last year um, where we were using PET-CT, so to look at uh, radioactive tracers in the body and what they tell us about glucose uptake. And that's basically based on an idea she had. I was writing a small grant in 2015 to use an imaging method, and she said, oh, why don't we also try and do this other imaging method to look at some of these things? And I was like, yeah, OK. And then that became probably one of the more important projects we've had in the lab. And so without giving her the freedom to think about that and taking that on board, we wouldn't have done this. Um, with Ben, he's you know, since two or three years ago, has been interested in open science. And so with others here, helped to establish the um, Edinburgh Open Research Initiative, which has been great. It's maybe one reason why, why many people are here today. Uh, he's written this really nice commentary um, last year about open research and collaborative research and research culture. And so that's just been really good to see. And um, it's probably one reason why I now find myself in this position as being the um, open research uh, ambassador for um, open science ambassador, sorry, for, for Larry for the university, because I've then helped to contribute in a small way to some of these other initiatives. So this is really important as a PI, I think. Um, but then, oh yeah, so, so then other things that we're sort of doing, and I wish we were doing better, we do have electronic lab notebooks, so we use our space. Uh, it still is inconsistent in which lab members use these well and which don't. I'm not very good at using them. Uh, and again, this gets back at being just very busy. Um, I've been wanting to write a lab manual since about 2018 um, and still haven't done it. We're getting much better at data management. So um, we've got sort of data dictionaries and we're starting to incorporate metadata in any of our spreadsheets and things like that. I did sign up to Open Science Framework a few years ago, but it's not something we use routinely. I would like to use it more. So then in the future, things like open publication of our protocols and protocols.io, the university subscribes to this, so it's a fairly easy thing to do. It just hasn't been a priority and we haven't had time. Um, for the next manuscript we're about to submit, we're going to use Review Commons, where um, you get the manuscript peer review first, and then you submit it to affiliated journals based on those reviews. Uh, I really want to complete a lab manual if I have time, need a more consistent approach to our space and the OSF. And something I'd like to try is uh, doing a registered report, and it's something we've spoken about in previous reproducibility meetings. So that's sort of all motivated by these intrinsic motivation to try and improve research, and I think it's important for communication. But just to point out that a lot of it is um, a result of extrinsic factors, um, basically being lucky. So I've been really lucky to have good funding since I started here in 2015. And I think if you've got that funding, then you're no longer scrabbling for resources. You can then devote time not just to writing grants, but to establishing your lab, to doing the research. You don't have this fear that you have to play the impact factor game to be able to get funding. Um, uh, you know, and since then I've had grants get rejected because uh, reviewers have sort of said, oh, you're not publishing impactful enough research in this. And you just think, oh, they probably haven't even read the research. They're just looking at the journals or whatever. But I've been fortunate in that regard. And certainly I would sympathize with any PIs who have been struggling for funding who think, oh, it's all well and good taking these like magnanimous approaches to open research and open data. But if you're really competing for funding, you need to play the game. And I can see why people think that. Uh, I work on bone marrow adipose tissue, and if you haven't heard of that, you're not alone. It's quite a small field, although it's growing quickly, but it's really um, quite a friendly, collaborative field. There isn't a sense of competition or sort of snarkiness and um, that kind of uh, attitude. And so it hasn't been, there hasn't been that pressure like, oh, we're going to get scooped and beaten to this because no one else is really working on it. It's probably changing and you see things now and you think, oh, God, we need to get this published. Um, and then maybe you cut corners or you rush things or whatever, but, uh, or, or you don't publish your data openly because you're worried about getting scooped. But that hasn't been an issue for me, so I've been lucky there. And then I think it's coincided with bigger changes in research culture. So if you think about open access now, it's kind of a no brainer. And a lot of that has actually been thanks to the uh, latest REF, where it was a requirement 
For papers to be assessed, for outputs to be included, they had to be openly available. And then we've had the emergence of um, preprint servers, uh, so just two of them there. And I think we've seen, particularly during the COVID pandemic, uh, there's been a real rapid shift to embracing those and to valuing that way of communicating research quickly. So then I, I think the, these extrinsic things and the in, intrinsic things, the, the mismeasurement, et cetera, I've talked about, they really reflect uh, the need to change research culture more broadly. Even if you're incredibly motivated as an individual, if you feel like you're swimming against the tide, then it's really hard to make progress. So that's why we need um, to think about broader uh, initiatives to advance um, research openness uh, and research culture in general. So, I mean, you'll probably be aware of DORA, um, which the University of Edinburgh signed two years ago, and that's about sort of improving uh, research assessment, moving away from impact factors and various other things that have, um, that have been happening. This is all really focused on metrics, but um, just for research culture and research and welfare more broadly, it, uh, it still applies. Um, and this is just talking about the, the, the incentives behind, uh, the, the rationale behind DORA and why it was first established um, nearly 10 years ago. Right, and so because I'm very disorganised, uh, the whole bit on LERU, um, <laughs> look, I didn't even, it's the League of European Research Universities, and so I've actually not even got that right because I was scrambling this morning with, with coffee and children to try and get this together. It might just be a time now to, to go out of the um, presentation, although actually I'll just go on to this. Um, so I think what I find particularly jarring with science assessment is that it goes against many of the principles of science itself. So if we're doing practicing science, we want it to be statistically sound and evidence based. We should be challenging dogmas and trying to break new ground and thinking creativity, um, creative solutions. But the way science has been assessed has been none of those things. Impact factors don't make sense statistically. There's no evidence that these ways of assessing researchers leads to better outcomes. It's a very dogmatic approach, but it persists. And if you try and think of more creative solutions, then kind of you're swimming against this dogma. Um, so the future though is, is looking brighter. These things are changing. Um, so we should go back now to Leru and the open research roadmap. I'm just gonna I could, I don't, I'm aware of the time and I don't want to eat up too much time. So I don't know, um, Neve or, or Laura, if you think we should just go for a discussion. I can go through some of the points for um, Leru and open research, if that would be helpful. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't mind. Um, it's it's kind of entirely up to to you and, and, and the audience. Like, mm -hmm. I'm aware that we kind of were, it's 20 to 12 now. So I don't know yeah. if, we want, if we want to, it would be better to use this time for a Q&A um, if people want to kind of ask you more specific things about the points you raised. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, so I'll just quickly say that LERU basically identified, the, the European Commission identified what are called eight pillars of open research, things around metrics, open access publications, public engagement, lots of things, citizen science, um, and they proposed a roadmap that its member institutions should adopt and amend according to their own needs. And now various institutions, there's 23 major universities in Leru, various of those have um, now published their roadmaps or are working on them. So the University of Edinburgh uh, should be publishing our roadmap soon. There's been some sticking points for things around like um, researcher assessment and promotion. So to what extent should we acknowledge open research practices when we're assessing or promoting researchers? Um, that kind of thing. But it's nearly ready. And um, I think it will be really helpful to have this formal roadmap that makes the university more accountable and also shows an example to researchers and makes them say, hey, this is being recognised. And if I do these things, it won't be a complete waste of time because my efforts there will be acknowledged. So maybe, yeah, we could just go to an open discussion. I don't know if people just want to ask questions or talk about anything. I hope it's been useful-ish because I haven't really given concrete advice about, oh, you should do this as a PI because, uh, yeah. No, it's been really helpful hearing your uh, lived experience as the PI uh, with your own, with, yeah, it's the complete picture. So this is exactly what we were hoping for. Thank you so much, Will. I'm just going to stop the recording now so we can move mm -hmm. on to the Q&A. Yeah. Do you want to maybe?